Um, hello, my name is Neil Crockett. I'm the CEO of the Digital Catapult, um, which is an organization that's helping people with great ideas and data innovation get to market quicker. Um, but I could talk for hours, but that's not really the point of the panel today. Um, so I just really want to um, get to introduce the panel. But before we start, I just wanted to say something in terms of my perspective of this, um, of this session. And it's in God we trust, all others bring data. And it's a very interesting choice of title, um, because actually, as a lot of us know, in God we trust is the, is the actual slogan on a dollar bill. And a lot of people are saying that big data is as valuable, I think World Economic Forum said data is as valuable an asset type as oil and gold. So there's clearly a lot of money and innovation and growth. I think the real thing we're here to talk about today is not so much that making money, it's more about how can we help us as citizens, us as people, us as a society, um, live better, be healthier, and actually have a better life. So I think that's the side of it we're probably going to major on today. Um, so if um, we can talk to the panel, hopefully they can tell us where the value is, they can tell us what's happening next, and they can tell us what's stopping us get there. So that's what we're trying to do in this session. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panel, then I'm going to lead some questions, give a bit of direction, and as soon as we can, I'm going to get it over to you to ask some questions of the panel yourselves. So if I could just take it in, in order, everyone, if we could just do an introduction for about two minutes, and then I'll move on to the questions. Thanks. Well, maybe my introduction will be shorter because I'm still Alex Bartfeld. Um, <laughs> Just done it. <laughs> I'm from um, I'm from Cloudera again. Um, for those of you who weren't in the session before, we are a um, data management software company built on open source Apache Hadoop. Uh, my name is Niall Levery. I'm director of a, a team called the Insight Studio in Deloitte. I'm also the head of data engineering in the UK. Um, and we do analytic services and products and, and solutions and strategy for uh, companies of all sizes across all industries. Um, so everything from kind of HSBC, Disney, uh, massive multinational conglomerates all the way down to small Scottish beverage manufacturers. Um, so hopefully we do a lot of stuff in healthcare as well, which hopefully will be a, a topic of resonance in, in the conversation today. Uh, I'm Aidan Flynn. Um, I'm a, a statistician or I guess these days, that might be analyst, data analyst, big data analyst. I'm not sure which of those terms apply, but statistician, I guess, is the one I'm more comfortable with. Uh, I'm the founder of Exploristics, uh, a company based here in, in Belfast. Uh, we provide services to pharma, biotech, medical devices, uh, and healthcare organizations uh, to help them use the data that they gather uh, and collect as part of their R&D uh, programs. Um, I've been working as a statistician for more than 20 years, uh, 10 of those at, at Glaxo, um, where I witnessed the explosion of data, getting involved in genetics, where we were measuring more than a million different data points per subject uh, in, a, in a clinical trial. So the whole concept of big data uh, really applied in that uh, in that arena. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'm Damien Fogarty. I'm a uh, consultant in the Belfast Trust uh, at the Belfast City Hospital. I'm a kidney specialist, um, but I, my my interest is much wider than that. I'm interested in diabetes, heart disease, cancer, lots of uh, conditions. And I've worked previously um, in Boston, Harvard University, where I did some epidemiology and first got into statistics and an analysis of data sets as it applied to clinical and genetic uh, data then. I came back here and, and uh, worked with Queen's as a senior lecturer. I've just recently left Queen's and I'm back in the health service <coughs> full time. But my main interest, I suppose, in this area is that I've, I've headed up a national registry based in Bristol. Uh, which collects data electronically from 72 renal units across the UK. It's the largest and leanest uh, national registry that I'm aware of. Uh, we can certainly do a national audit uh, for a tenth of the price of the HSCIC uh, because it is led by clinicians like myself and I'm, I'm just standing on the shoulders of others before me 
who, who designed the, the, the questions and asked the data and, and took control of the data within those individual okay. renal units. The other important thing that's spun out of that is a thing called Renal Patient View, which some of you may have heard of, whereby patients can look up results and see the results. And I've just come from a clinic this morning where I saw a patient who was able to look up his results before he came to see me. So uh, I want to see the patient in charge of their own data, and I would like to see much, much better analysis of not just big healthcare data, but how healthcare data interacts with social data, educational data, and so on. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, a very diverse, informed uh, panel for, for you to listen to and talk to this morning. Um, I mean, for me, we've used the word already, I think we've actually used three or four different terms around the phrase big data. Um, for me, it's actually, I, I'm much more interested in diverse data and um, velocity of data than I am in, in the bigness of it, but maybe we could just talk about the terminology here. What, very quickly, what, what do you mean by, or what do you think of when you think of big data analytics, just for the audience, so we calibrate ourselves here a bit? Yeah, I, I think um, the premise of your question is spot on. Um, Big data is, is not just a problem about how much data you have, and I think there have been a few comments today that there are a lot of organizations out there who actually don't have data volumes today that would by themselves justify running big data technologies. It's the, it's the complexity of the analytics that you want to run on those data sets which drives the new paradigms. Um, it's the ability to run search on um, on, on data sets which are unstructured, semi-structured, um, multiple different data variants, um, images, videos, uh, CSV files, and, and actually build intelligence based off of that. The, the ability to do schema on read, not schema on write, um, in my opinion is revolutionary and it will transform um, medical science uh, in, in enormous ways. So, yeah, big data in some ways is probably a misnomer. It, it's not just about the bigness, yes. it's about the complexity. Yeah, thank you. I agree. Um, and I think although there's a lot of different terms, there is a commonality amongst professionals as to what their understanding of the challenge that people face at the minute. So it's about dealing with disparate sources and different, disparate types of information, as Alex has said. So we take a, a one specific example. So I mentioned Disney earlier on. Um, so Disney obviously run several absolutely massive theme parks and one of the projects that we've helped them out with is taking video feeds to measure footfall across different parts of the parks, where people are going to, so direction of travel, which rides they're going to, what the forward booking and that ride's going to be, so structured data, video feeds, unstructured data around social, trying to map that together so they can have the right people in the right place at the right time, guiding people to the right rides, making sure that they're trying to protect forward loads to make sure the user experience or the customer experience is good. And that has to be real time or else it's useless. Yeah. So dealing with all those disparate sources, mashing it together, being able to process it and present it in a way that someone with an iPad walking around a, or an iPhone walking around a park can read and, and understand. Yeah. It's not just about the data. So big data is the challenge, but the solution is uh, partly technology, but also partly the, the people um, you know, to be able to deal with being able to come up with pragmatic solutions it's to really you, complex you, issues. You raise a very interesting point, the, 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 whole, the whole thing about context in real time, which I think yeah. people miss often the dimension of this. Absolutely. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, I do tend to agree that the use of the term big data is, is unfortunate um, because it, it takes away from a couple of key points for me. Um, one is what, what question are you actually trying to, to answer? And I think quite often, uh, in, in most cases and most organizations, the data that you need are not big at all. Um, it's much more to do with quality um, and whether the, you've collected the data in the right context to answer um, that particular uh, question. Um, so I think focusing on big data, I think, you know, and, and in meetings like this, you will hear a, a lot about the technology and about storage and all of that, but it takes away from, you know, the, the, the data need to be relevant. That's one. Uh, key area. The other is, and it's been mentioned before, is the, the, the analytics part. If you go to many big data conferences, and as I said, the focus is on the storage of the data. Yeah. And having data is obviously good, but using it is where the real value uh, is. So turning that data 
into some type of information that you can act upon it is, is where the value, yeah, yeah. the value lies, yes. Yeah. Right, good, thank you. Give me. So, uh, I, I mean, I've just recently come to know the term, but I, my, my uh, training and background is, it's not what the data size or structure is, it's the question is the most critical thing. And a couple of quick examples, the link between smoking and lung cancer was made in a data set with a couple of hundred patients on a small spreadsheet with a couple of variables. And the key there was the right question was asked and the right design of the, the, the study to actually explore that. That's fundamentally important. And in fact, if you start looking at very large data sets, statistically and epidemiologically, you can start seeing lots of associations that are not causative for the disease. We've got to be careful in the interpretation. The question's got to be right, and the people who are asking the question and interpreting the output need to understand their condi the condition, and is that a plausible link between item A equals item B? Good, thank you. So hopefully that's set the context. And got, a lot of people still would say, so and, and, and what's the point? And I think the best way of doing that is telling stories. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you to maybe take one story you have in your own mind. I'll, I'll start with Damien this time. Um, one story you have in your experience that sort of illuminates the, the value we can get out of the insight given by data and anal analysis. So, so, well, I, I'll tell one quickly. So I look after, in the National Registry, we, we, we track numbers of patients starting dialysis. And we've got you know, uh, large data sets with about 100,000 patients. That's not very large in, your, in some of your terms in Google search or any of these other terms. But 100,000 patients in data set is very large. And we look at the numbers of patients starting different types of treatment. And then we follow them up and look at their survival and, and so on. And uh, one of the interesting things that, that I'm interested in is what happens with the elderly patients. Because I know that elderly patients often don't get offered treatment and that's a, a great source of problem for both the individual, clearly, if they don't get treatment that may, they may benefit from, from the patients, it's a source of complaints. And we, we try to look at the, the numbers of elderly patients who are starting dialysis treatment. And uh, it's clear there's a 40-fold variation in that. And what I can't get out of anywhere is that I want to know, uh, I want to be able to link that very quickly to population statistics to know, well, what, what is that? Is that is that 40-fold variation in numbers of elderly patients over 80 starting dialysis treatment? Is that real? Or is it due to there's more elderly patients living in that area? So I need to be able to, to link that, that sort of question. That's a population public health question. That's one example. Second example is uh, I have a patient that comes along today to the clinic. And they say to me, well, I'm, I'm, I would like to come off this drug. One, and this is a true story. This morning, a patient came to me. They're on Prozac for many years. Uh, they're a dialysis patient. And I, and I said, well, we should try to get you off that. And I says, but I'm not quite sure. I'll ask the GP about that. I says, I'll need to, know, need to know a little bit more about understanding the issues with coming off the drug. And for me to search and look for that answer would take about an hour. And I'm very quick at searching for, for medical data. So uh, I just don't have the tools to quickly answer certain questions that are slightly more complex because the questions have been driven by often pharma industry, which is, dr is drug A better than drug B? Right. When I really want to know when you're coming off drug A, right. are there issues? And no, the drug company has an interest in that because there's no money in coming off a drug, let's face it. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to come out great. So I'm actually going to come back to those challenges and ask other people about their views. But before we do that, I'd just like to, from your experience, what you've seen or experienced, what, give us an example of some real value add from analyzing a data set and, and getting insight. Um, well, I, I was involved in a, a collaborative network here in, in Northern Ireland around the use of healthcare uh, analytics. And part of that scoping study, we did a, a survey of uh, other regions where perhaps analytics is um, more w widely used. And there were some great examples that came up as part of that mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in Scotland, for example, um, where there's much better sharing of information in diabetes patients yeah, between primary and secondary care, that had marked impact in the treatment of uh, patients with diabetes, such as a 90% reduction in the number of amputations for patients. I mean, massive um, uh, impact there. Uh, waiting times in orthopedic uh, surgeries were reduced from 86 weeks to 8 weeks as a result of analysing mm -hmm. the data. So real 
impact uh, to, to patients just through analyzing data. Great, thank you. We've got lots of health examples. Maybe we can widen it out to some other examples now. Yeah, um, well, you've, you've thrown me. No, use a health one if you want. That's no, so fine. so <laughs> I'll give you two very, very quick okay. ones. Uh, so the first, um, I guess, uh, as a segue into something else then, is, is around healthcare. So uh -huh. if you think about the NHS in England, they spend £7 billion every year on education and training. Hmm. Right? So all of those decisions are largely driven by anecdotal opinion. Um, and very, because of the vast amounts of data that would be required to underpin an evidence-based approach to that, it's very, very challenging. So we now run a, a national service for Health Education England um, that helps them grasp the concept of what does demand look like in 15 years' time for consultant neurosurgeons. Now, I guarantee it's not right, but what it is is a more informed evidence-based approach to being able to make very, very significant decisions. And if all we do is shave 1% of that wasted cost, Right, out of all of that seven billion, then we've paid for ourselves many, many, many times over. Um, but a, a non-healthcare example, uh, so we work with a, a large European retailer, and they found that they had a lot of shop stock that they couldn't shift. So a lot of stuff just sitting on the shelf, um, and they had no real idea how to incentivize people to be able to lift the stock. And the, the, the usual tactic for this in the retail space is to discount. Okay, so you've, you've got uh, what they call markdown processes, and they'll have markdown windows associated with sale seasons, and it could be anywhere from one to four seasons a year. So how, do you, how and when do you mark down to be able to do this? Now, Amazon's very good, but this was a clothing retailer where um, they struggled to understand what stock they had in shops, how, what buying patterns were across different locations and geographies. So again, we were able to work with them with some of our retail specialists and some of our analytic specialists to put together an analytical model that allowed them dynamically to get a response per, per SKU, one SKU per 0.5 of a second, so they could run this on thousands of SKUs within a relatively short query on an online system, and it would actually tell them, here is your markdown profile for that SKU. On this date, marked at this price, you will clear stock. So we did a project for them, it was relatively small. Um, unfortunately, we charged a fixed fee, but uh, the net benefit was tens of millions of pounds across Europe. And that's just one little project with, with the right people, the right sense. brains, the right technology. Okay, Alex? Yeah, and I, I'm just going to pick up on um, some of those comments about costs, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, clearly, you know, analytics is is the um, it, that's the target. I mean, that's where everyone's driving towards. But government, for example, um, we do a lot of work with central government um, in the UK, and they have an imperative to just manage the cost of their data. And um, there are analytical systems out there where um, organizations are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars per terabyte. Uh, and what we would argue is that there are absolutely applications for those very high-end systems um, that today at least cannot be run on Hadoop or other big data technologies. No doubt about it. But not all of your data needs to fly first class. There is a lot of space in economy. Um, and Going back to, um, to healthcare and life sciences, when I, you know, I, I'm not from that background, I have some exposure to it through some of our customers. When I heard that there was going to be a, um, a medical life science flavor to this discussion, I spoke to one of the data scientists at Cloudera, and he pointed me to a website that analyzes um, the history of genomics. And um, you're going to keep me honest on this. Um, the, and you can, you, can, um, you can Google this later if you Google cost per genome. Um, there's a great chart there that shows in 2003, which I think was a couple of years after they first sequenced the human genome, um, it cost around $100 million per genome to sequence. In 2013, last year, anyone want to guess what it cost to sequence a genome? Anyone venture a guess? 600. 500 quid? $8,000. $8,000. So, look, that, that is not all about um, technology savings. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, medical scientists uh, and, and people cost going into that. But clearly, the ability to do some, uh, you know, gen a genome is clearly a big data problem in a more cost effective way um, is, is really what is driving a lot of organizational strategy right now. Thanks, Alex. You talked about some challenges that you had. 
And I just wanted to ask the panel, listening to Damon's challenges in terms of the frustrations, I think a little bit of say frustrations mm -hmm. that you have in terms of getting to a value that you can't get to. Any thoughts on how you might, what's going to happen next, how you might get there? Yeah, he should talk to a statistician. <laughs> and you know one. I do. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think that's an interesting point. Um, so, like I mean, even in the conversation we were having before we came up, and, and knowing how different people in the panel are approaching the challenge, right? So we, we have a, a, a classic mix. So we've got a technologist, we've got a statistician, and we've got the kind of, you know, the, the archetypal, if you'll excuse the expression, business leader, right? And one of the things, one of the key things that we do is, is help organizations build analytical capability. And there are tensions between all three of those different groups of people, and it's only by getting those people together to work in a collaborative way share understanding and trust between each other, that analytics will really drive value for an organization. And that's not necessarily easy, but everything has its part to play. If, if any one group of people, so a bunch of smart statisticians with limited tools and small data, or a bunch of technology people with limited business understanding and not a massively statistical background, were able to solve the problem, it would have been solved before. But now what we're seeing is this convergence of all of these different types of skills and technologies and tools and data that's actually unlocking the business value in this. And I think that's, that's just a really interesting uh, area for me to explore. Okay, great. Alex, any solace just, to just, Well, Can I just add a quick comment? The, the, I agree, you know, the technologist, the, the analyst, and the, the person asking the question, and the business leader, as you talk, call me, that's very good. That's certainly the first time we call that. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I think there is an important tension here between public and private sector, because if I was the business leader, mm -hmm. Clearly, I would have done this. If I'd had control of the HSC budget for a day, there would be things would be very different. But I'm not, and there are important aspects about the tension and trust between within public sector organizations. And the final element is, of course, the, the individual who isn't here, which is the patient whose data it is, or the individual whose data it is, be it a Tesco club card holder or the person walking through the Disney theme park. Uh, so there are elements of, of trust and and collaboration within those relationships too. Yeah. Alex, did you want to give him some solace? And well, no, not necessarily. I definitely don't want to um, get into um, that minefield of a kind of ethical discussion on, on whose data it is. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, do, I do take your point that some of the people who um, complain most loudly about uh, data privacy are very happy to post pictures of themselves falling out of a bar um, half naked, or, <laughs> or you know, give all of their transactions, um, yeah. shopping um, history to Tesco Club Card. Um, I, uh, you know, as an uh, uh, as a private citizen, I do wonder um, w what advances could be made if medical researchers such as yourself did have access to wider data sets and how we break down some of those barriers. Yeah. Okay. So, maybe, maybe sorry, maybe if I can just add one no, thing. Can I just one thing? I wanted to, there's one more question. I've, only, I've been given a signal to stop the panel and ask the audience. So. <laughs> so I, no, just, no, um, just, just that the, the whole the analytics process, in my view, needs to be collaborative and yeah, yeah. often iterative, yeah. and that interaction between technologist, statistician, and the end user, and I would say the person who also understands the data and where it came from. Uh, it is important uh, to, to get to the right answer. Thank you. I, I am going to keep on this bone about... It says in the, in the actual title here, In God We Trust, so the word trust has come up at least four times now. And I don't want to get into a debate because it's, it's really not a debate for this table, but there is clearly a tension between the value we get from personal data, which you would love to have, mm -hmm. and a need to balance that with people do want to understand that the data they give is got transparency and permission, there's that sort of trust and privacy. I'm not going to try and say the ethical thing, but what's the way forward? Because that seems to me to be something which is a glass ceiling on this if we're not careful. It, what, what happens next to try and, just very quickly, what happens next, do you think, to move this forward? It, it, it is changing. So, um, you know, again, sticking with healthcare and life sciences, we're working with a number of pilots between Big Pharma and the NHS. Um, and those organizations are getting access to pseudonymized patient level data. Now that doesn't allow them to identify individuals, but what it does allow them to do is run far more targeted, and we'll, we'll, we'll excuse what it is they're looking for in these trials, but it'll run far more informed targeted trials to help develop 
better treatments for specific demographic of uh, you know risk stratified patient. So it's better anonymization techniques is going to what's going. Well, to I think what's happening is it's now inexcusable. Everybody's recognizing that it is inexcusable for these barriers to exist and are finding ways, acceptable ways to work at night. It's early days, but these pharma companies are working not on a national level, but with provider trusts and with commissioning organizations at a local level and sharing data based on very strict understanding of how that's going to be used and how it's going to be passed. I'm going to ask everyone for a quick 30-second thought on what happens next to try and resolve this tension. Alex? Well, I, that, that's for um, people in government and people in large organizations um, to figure out. I, you know, we, we provide the infrastructure, um, but I, I, I agree that um, not, not only is, un, is it unacceptable um, to not be able to, you know, as we started by, by saying, um, you know, it, it improve society, improve medicine and, and other fields of humanity using big data. But, um, you know, I, I wonder if the next generation actually really cares. Um, mm. You know, I, I look at, uh, you know, my kids are a little bit young, but, you know, teenagers and, and people in their early 20s, and they've just grown up accepting that their world is online and they are sharing data in the course of normal human activity. And um, I, I wonder if just culturally the barriers just come down. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Has anyone else got anything they want to say on that no, topic? I, th I think it is changing. Um, I think if the people in charge of the, if you like, the closest to the user where the data is coming from are the people telling, the me giving the message of benefit, then then you will you, then it will happen. In our national audit, out of 100,000 registered patients, four have come back to us and said, we, do, we want you to take our data out four out of 100,000, which is the lowest, again, because it's been run by the people who are using it, who understand it, and where the trust is greatest. And where you can find the value. Yeah. 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 Okay, I think um, I've stretched the panel as much as I should. I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Have we got some microphones? Great. Have we got any questions for the panel? Hi, Owen, McFadden. <coughs> Pardon me. Owen McFadden from the Department of Enterprise and also challenge it or channeling my inner Jason Bell apparently as well who's tweeting me from the bus. A uh, couple of quick questions. One is uh, from Jason, the IDC state 99.5% of data that's produced is never processed. Do you think that's actually likely to change in a substantial way? Are we going to end up in a situation where the oil reference has been used before, we're going to actually start seeing us actually drilling and actively going back into the old data as well and all of that information. Other question, quick question from Jason is, and it also from my perspective, from a policy perspective, what opportunities do you see for Northern Ireland in the data arena? I mean, we have in some indicative evidence we actually have quite good strengths in Northern Ireland in our business base here. And one, what should our public sector be doing to facilitate, encourage, accelerate that development? And also from Jason, the recent announcement of Yahoo moving to Dublin over concerns over security. I know as Alex mentioned about the public sector being a benefit in terms of data analytics, but seeing Yahoo move to Dublin on the grounds of security concerns, is that something we need to be concerned about here or can we turn that to our advantage? Okay. Who would like to take the, um, I guess someone on, Maybe not Alex, but someone else in terms of Northern Ireland and what can we be doing to take advantage of this whole data area? I mean, uh, just a very quick one. Northern Ireland has some very unique characteristics. So if you look at the DVLA, for example, they have a single joined up data set associated with MOTs. Nowhere else that I'm aware of in, in the developed world has that, possibly the US, but I, I really don't think so. Certainly not in the UK. Um, and that allows them to be able to do things like, why are we not predicting failure rates in particular types of cars? Because you've got every car pretty much in the country flowing through that system and you've got it all. You know the failure rate, the time of occurrence, um, how many miles are on the clock. You could do some fantastic correlation. And then the great thing is you can just sell that straight back to the manufacturer and they will pay a lot of money. So Northern Ireland, the way that it's set up, healthcare is somewhat similar in that it's a lot more joined up in some ways than, than other parts. So we, we sometimes probably underestimate the value of the assets that we have. Uh, I'll just add to that. Uh, health and social care is actually formally joined up here since 2007, long before it became uh, a joined up process in the NHS in England. 
Scotland uh, were behind us in the HSC, but they were ahead of us in terms of the their openness to joining up uh, data. They've always had a much more uh, uh, open approach to data. Uh, so I think that, I mean, we have huge opportunities. Lack of migration is important here. We have a fairly stable population for, for medical studies, lifelong st studies. We have a very good GP system in terms of the, the connectivity. Uh, and there's, there's a lot, lot of positives. Uh, however, it's already been pointed out by the King's Fund that despite us having a joined up HNC sector, health and social care sector, there's been no analysis of that, absolutely none, of, of significance. Okay. Hidden, any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of things going um, for, for Northern Ireland. Um, haven't set a, a company up here, um, but uh, you know, I started it from uh, living in, in, in London. Um, you know, we have got a, a very great a uh, well-educated population with a great work ethic. To set a company up here is much more cost-effective than many other uh, uh, parts of the, the UK. So we've got a lot going for us uh, on the population level as well. Great. And there was a public sector element. Alex, did you have any comments on that particular? Yeah, well, I, I can't speak about Northern Ireland because today's actually my first time ever in Northern Ireland. Um, <laughs> The view from the taxi window is great, though. Um, but, uh, you know, first of all, um, most of the technologies, foundational technology generally these days is open source, um, which means that there are people all over the world, world developing it, contributing towards it. Um, and to uh, advance the pace of innovation, you need some of the best, best minds. And, you know, one of the reasons that we work with Kanos is that they have very... Um, deep partnerships with some of the academic institutions in Northern Ireland, which we're certainly hoping to leverage in the wider open source community in the future. Um, there was a question about public sector and how big data benefits it. The, the UK government's data management strategy, in my opinion, is bang on. Um, they're looking to move to open source um, to benefit from the pace of innovation, but also to uh, make sure they don't get locked into long-term contracts on proprietary software, which have burned them in the past. Um, and I think there was also a question about security. Uh, we're not allowed to talk about most of our customers, but we are allowed to say that uh, three of the largest um, intelligence agencies in the US, the three-letter acronym types, are all customers of ours. And they themselves actually contribute towards um, open source projects. And uh, for example, the NSA um, built a Hadoop project called Accumulo, which provides cell level security. So they are not just consumers in public sector, but they are also big contributors towards, yeah. um, towards these technologies. Okay. So there the, was the question about the volume of data and yeah. Yeah, I the, the first lack question. of... The 99.5% of yeah, data yeah. isn't used. I'm not, yeah. Where did that come from? Would be my first question. Is it is it accurate and fair? Actually, could you repeat the question? Is <laughs> my first question. Sure. Uh, I'll just speak up for. Oh, Mike. Uh, this is Jason speaking rather than me, but he I miss, he was quoting the IDC. I'm assuming that's International Data Council. Okay. It's a TLA, three-letter abbreviation, and he's saying they state 99.5% of data will never get processed or has never been processed to date. The question is. Is that a resource we should actually be drilling back down into? Not just what we're currently producing, but yes. what we've already got. Okay, uh, thank you. Maybe for I can that. answer yeah, yeah, that uh, in part. I, I suspect there's an awful lot of data out there that are in uh, unstructured format in text files, social networking sites. Um, a lot of it is just noise mm -hmm. um, that is probably pretty uninformative, really. Um, so. How much value there is in analysing that, I, I'm I'm not so sure. Um, I, but I know there are new tools and techniques, natural language processing, which might be able to pull out some um, uh, some trends in there. But I think in general it is just noisy data, and I think that's generally true with big data that's out there. It is full of bias. It's full of missingness. That's misreported. So we need to, you know, be careful about investing a lot of time trying to pull out um, signals in very messy data. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think the, the simple answer to your question is we don't know. Um, managers in the room, um, including myself, I don't know what questions the stakeholders in my business are going to ask 
tomorrow, let alone in one year, in 10 years' time. So all we can do is provide a, um, a, a, a framework where we can actually hold that data in its original format, full fidelity, um, so that when those questions do get asked in the future, we have a way of accessing that information. I would agree. I wouldn't be as negative. I mean, if, if somebody has asked a question, be it in, at the DVLA or in education, and felt it important enough to put it on a computer in the first place, there clearly is utility in its use at that time. And if it's useful to the inputter of the data, it must be useful at some point in the future. That would be my simple approach to it. Uh, we, don't, we haven't looked at it yet, and we don't understand it, and we don't think on a wide enough way, but my guess is if somebody thought it was useful enough to take at the start, it probably has some utility. Just one, one word answer to the question, right? So is that percentage going to improve? Yes. No. <laughs> I think no. The rate of data capture is going to increase, at least in line with the rate of data processing. If you travel forward 50 okay. years, you could potentially tap into the memory of every individual on the planet. Okay. Right? It's not going to happen. Back to question A. Mm. Yeah. So, the, um, I, I, so my, my, own view, my own view on this is actually what matters, and I think said at the beginning, is diversity of data. And I think insight comes from different data sets colliding together, so whether it's small or big. So uh, actually my answer is I don't think we know what value lies out in there, because actually it's not data sets themselves, it's when they collide and you get the insight. So that would be maybe my thought on that. Any questions? From, I think we're out of time. Are we out of time? Any more questions from the audience? Okay, I'd just like to thank the panel. Thank you for your time and thank you as an audience.